Welcome to the Jeff Knows Inc. Entrepreneurial Podcast with your host, Jeff Lopes. Jeff has over two decades experience as a serial entrepreneur, building brands like Kimuraware from his home basement to a multi-million dollar global brand that has sold over a quarter million pairs of boxing gloves. Jeff's here to educate, guide, and drive you on the process of bringing your ideas and dreams to reality with the inspiring stories from some of the top business minds. Welcome to episode 165 of the Jeff Nosing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Lope. Super excited to have on today the angel coach herself, Emily Rivera. Great conversation. Sit back, everyone, and enjoy. This podcast is brought to you by BetterHelp. With the current climate in this world, it's now more important than ever to take stock in your mental health and for once, take time to work on yourself. BetterHelp offers a personalized online counseling and therapy service that will connect you to a safe and private online environment. BetterHelp is here to assess you with your needs and match you with your own licensed therapist. It's a lot more affordable than your traditional counseling and financial aid is always available. Right now, Jeff Knows Inc. listeners get an extra 10% off your first month just by visiting BetterHelp.com forward slash Jeff knows that's right visit b-e-t-t-e-r-h-e-l-p dot com forward slash Jeff knows to get 10% off your first month we are live we are live on the Jeff knows Inc. podcast I'm your host Jeff Lopes super excited to have on today Emily Rivera what is up how are you I am doing fabulous. Thank you so much for asking. Before we on air, we've actually been talking for about five, 10 minutes and uh, getting to know Emily and uh, just her her history, her children, stuff like that. I want our audience to kind of know a little bit more of what you're currently doing. And then we're going to go on and just talk about your upbringing and where you're brought up and how, what got you into the field and, and all those kind of stuff like that. So what are you up to now? So currently I'm an intuitive coach and I've been doing this for over a decade, have helped people with growing companies, building companies, you know, financial growth. Um, I've helped people with personal situations, divorce, cancer. Um, The way that I work, I I hear guidance, I see guidance, I experience guidance moving through my body. Um, So everybody I work with is very unique. And then the the guidance and the coaching that gets provided is very unique, very catered to a person's journey. Um, And I'm currently working on helping kids that are sensitive and intuitive. Um, And even though I've been, my company's been running for over a decade, I'm branching out to creating or developing a new part of the company or a new way to deliver, um, serving more of the younger generation. What got you into that? Well, I was one of these kids and even within the work of, of, of doing what I've been doing, I've had a lot of these kids find me on their own, Yeah, you know, so I've been helping them or parents find me. Um, and then I've been coaching these children since the youngest has been around eight, like personal one-on-one coaching. Um, and it's been beautiful to see because it's helped these children enable a level of confidence into understanding why they're sensitive and why they're intuitive and how that's really their superpower. And from experience, the children that I've worked with, when they can really own and understand why they have their gift, um, their accessibility beyond the normal, um, it's because they're here to do something greater, right? They're here to deliver something that goes outside the normal, and that's what they need to lean into as they're as they're growing up. And um, I mean, I've had kids create companies at young ages and become multimillionaires, and then I've had other kids who've just... Um, created programs and things to help other children and other, and other people in, in walks and in walks of life. So, yeah. So when a parent comes to you and sources out your, your knowledge, your ability to help the, their, their children pull what's inside them out, like what's the process? Like, wh- how do you, I mean, is there everybody you take on or is there individuals you kind of say like, I'm, I, we're not going to work with you. Do you take on every kind of situation with the children or how does that all thing be? I mean, what a child has and what a parent thinks they have could be totally different. That's a great sense. question. Yeah. That's a wonderful question. Um, usually when a parent finds me or if a child reaches out to me, like I had a child probably three, four weeks ago who reached out because she went from, 
label like quote unquote normal to all of a sudden hearing stuff and seeing stuff that she's never experienced. And, um, you know, usually when they come to me, it, it most of the time is a match. I'm trying to, you know, kind of go into my, my history. I don't, I don't, I haven't yet had a situation in which a parent comes to me and says, Hey, this is happening with my child. Can you help me? It's always usually yes. But when parents come to me, their children are seeing spirits, hearing stuff. They're seeing things about the future. They're talking about things that happen in past lives. Like it's just, there's, you know, I have, I have parents who reach out whose one-year-olds and two-year-olds are saying that they came here with other kids to help the planet, you know, kids that logically it's, it's, it's not, it's not something that we can say, oh, it was this, that's why they're saying that, right? It's like, they're coming to me because it's something that they feel is outside the normal and they've explored therapists, they've explored normal modalities to help situations and they're finding themselves feeling stuck. Um, so now, usually when a child or a parent comes to me, it's, it's, a, it's, it aligns where it's the perfect fit. Yeah. I was having this conversation the other day with somebody and um, this is a conversation we have a lot where um, the school system seem to suppress children from their creativity, from their energy nowadays. I mean, it's, it's, it feels like in a school system, a kid is not interested in listening to the teacher. Their energy could be focused on something that they enjoy doing. And because they're, they can't focus on that, that subject or the not automatically it's let's medicate them or let's push them to the side or, or let's label them or diagnose them with something. Where's your mindset with that? That's, I used to be an ESE teacher, um, okay. which I, I honestly feel I was in preparation to all of this. And as you know, my, as, as I mentioned, my daughter has Moet Wilson syndrome. So she also felt falls under a very untraditional way of, of, of guiding. Um, it's interesting because what I, audible thought or word I heard is like, I feel like our systems have been very well um, equipped to teach children to conform. Yeah. Um, and a lot of time, these kids who are sensitive and intuitive have a really hard time because they're not just within, they're not just sitting in a space of what's easily tangible or experienced through the senses or they're, they're having more taking place. And I do agree that a lot, a lot of these kids end up getting medicated because, um, you know, it's like, how do you help? How do you, what do you do when there's no toolkits or no answers into like, how do I get them to sit still? How do I get them to not be so emotional? How do I get them not to be so, you know, and I'm hearing the word obsessive, right? Obsessive yeah. even you know, with their, their behavior and, and their distractions. Um, so based on that word, I feel like my hallucination is that these kids are coming to change our systems. Like that's part of their purpose. And, and the challenges that we're having within the system, education, and, and, and even in the, they're saying even in labor, you know, even in the workforce is like, there's certain challenges that we're coming um, to have that are intentional. They're intentional because there's changes that we are needing to make in the system, the way we teach and guide a child. Um, and, and there are going to be more of these kids challenging the system so that we get to a place in which we say change is a must. It's not a maybe, it's a must. Um, and where, where is your mindset to, I mean, just because you're talking about change in, in, in the system, I, I'm a strong believer in our educational system, especially when you get to the high school level, doesn't mm -hmm. prepare our young youth for the real world. I mean, uh, certain things that be, should be taught. I'm, I'm a strong believer is just sales, networking, um, mm -hmm. communication, certain stuff or not. And, and, and they're stuck with algebra and stuff. They're not going to really use in the real world. You're coming from that, that sector. Where's your mindset with our educational system? And I'm going, I'm going totally, uh, probably not where we are expected to go. I just, I just want to hear your mindset with that. Oh, no, I, I love this. I love this. Um, one of the things that I'm seeing, and I'm, 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 I'm seeing myself walk when I used to be an ESE teacher, I worked with gifted kids as well. So me walking into a mainstream class looked very different than walking into a gifted class. And when you talk about the system, I, I think that there's been a code that's been cracked with gifted, like how gifted children are taught that 
if we could adopt a more of that type of education within the mainstream, we would actually be doing a better job in, in the networking and the, cause there's a lot of creative teaching that takes place. And a lot of, um, a lot is reinforced that helps the child to, to go outside. Um, and, and, and I'm seeing the word again, conform, like it helps them to, to expand their thinking and their perceiving and how, um, Thank you. It emphasizes critical thinking in a different way. Like it has them think this big, right? And let's create this big versus what most of our children are getting, which is very much out of the box. That's outdated. It's yeah, so outdated. Very, very yeah. outdated. Very outdated. To our modern times. It's like so it's 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 kind of interesting to even look at that, how illogical, you know, like so much of, of the old um is still trying to be fed to to the kids. But going back to that idea that my hallucination is that there is, there is a, there is, there are things in place that are in the education system that are working, but for some reason it's being kept within a certain group of kids versus understanding that the results that we're seeing with the gifted kids can also be compounded. If it it was more inclusive within all the kids. Yeah. I love that. I love that. A word you keep saying, um, intuition where's your mindset with intuition and and it's something a lot of people suppress and they don't whether you call it your your gut feeling or whatnot what's your what's your mindset and and how how do you describe or how do you describe or how do you allow people to 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 really focus on their intuition are you ready to unlock your full potential i want to introduce you to the fit healthy and happy podcast a powerful resource to transform your life today with expert interviews practical tips and inspiring stories this podcast is your roadmap to lasting wellness here's what a listener has to say i used to struggle with my health but this podcast changed everything it's like having a personal trainer nutritionist and life coach totally for free with over two thousand five star reviews we're a podcast you can trust the fit healthy and happy podcast available now wherever you get your podcasts you know it's a great question because i i feel that a lot of our words are very limited right okay. so right right from the bat when you say intuition so many of the listeners and even just myself and you like kind of go in one direction normally okay. right it's like we go this way um so I'm trying to identify like maybe even how to open that up even more just because to me, intuition is more a song. Um, you're going like to sing, sing for me, Emily. I'm going to sing for you. Maybe not right now. Maybe. <laughs> um, but I feel like they're showing me they're little, I'm being shown. So again, because this is like, this is my life. This is yeah. what we call intuition. So Oh, I love that. So it's like the idea that there's this constant perpetual conversation that is taking place with each of us, with life itself, right? There's this constant dialogue that's taking place. And that dialogue, that song that that we came to give freedom to, to sing, to collaborate with others in creating is constantly at play. And then we're born and and we're aware of it and we recognize it and we dance to it and we, you know, we sing to it, right. We play with it, but there's so much within our society that is requiring us to conform, to fit in, to feel accepted. Um, And that gets numbed, you know, it perpetually gets numb in different ways, depending on your lifestyle, your history, your parent, you know, the parents you grew up with, the home you grew up with. But the reason I'm describing it that way is because I know just from experience and, and, and from witnessing people, thousands of people, it's like, there's this inherent ability within all of us to be aware of this conversation, that this dialogue, thank you, that's taking place with life with others, right? So it's like, even just us meeting, you know, our logical mind may not be picking it up, but there's been a, there's a dialogue that's taking place beyond just our conversation, which people can call intuition, and that dialogue is helping us to lean in, you know, to lean back, to, to learn how to dance in this whole exchange you are having, even within this interview, which doesn't just serve us in the moment, but serves everybody else who's listening, right? And feeling pulled to listen. Do, do, you, do, you, do you think that pulls a lot from, I mean, the studies of NLP? 
because you're talking about a, a lot of the the, the, the when you're talking about um, the, a lot of this the words you're using the phrases it just locking to NLP like I'm an NLP master I don't use it I did it I don't know why I did it but I did it and uh, and and there are certain things I I've used for it for sales for business and stuff like that right but um, a lot of the things you're saying from modalities or stepping back instead it's a lot of his NLP so I'm assuming is that or a lot of your thought process comes from or no nope. No, no, interesting. No, I, and it's going to sound weird because, and I think I mentioned in the beginning, I mean, since little I've been guided, like I hear guidance, I see. When, when what age did that start? When, when was your first? My first memory was when I was five. So my first memory was when I was five years old and I was sitting in bed and there was this being master angel, whatever you, you feel comfortable calling it, but it was sitting with me and it was teaching me about humanity it was teaching me about the frailty of humanity and the physical body and, and how we're much greater than the physical body. And pretty much this, this is the first memory and this has continued throughout my life um, and helping me to really just stay open and understanding. So as, as a, let me jump in there as a child, when you approached your parents with it, were they open to listening to that or were they shutting it down? And, I'm, and, and don't take it the wrong way. I'm just, Oh no, no, no. This yeah, is yeah. great. It's, it's a great question, which is, it's also fuels my why of why I'm helping these kids. Yeah. Um, I was very blessed and that when I would talk about things or express things, my parents never made me feel different. Like even going to church, I went to Catholic church and we used to go into like, you know, the, the learning and the training. Um, and I would say stuff, I'd say, well, God said this, and I saw this and, and, you know, and it's like, they were like, oh, good. Keep listening. Like I actually didn't realize that not everyone could hear and see like I did until I was in college. That's how interesting life played out where even my friends in middle school and high school, it's like conversations like this were very welcome. Like it was just never questioned. So I, it's kind of like that idea, like, well, how did you learn to breathe? Right. And it's like, I never knew. I Any didn't different. understand. Yes. I didn't understand that it wasn't normal for everyone until again, and I was in college. But you did ask with the NLP. Um, I don't know NLP. I haven't studied NLP. Um, part of what's happened with me since that I can remember since middle school is that I've been very, um, they've asked me not to read or, or do certain things. And when they want me to read or learn, it'll be brought to me. And the reason why, which is an interesting thing to, to share that this is what guidance I got is that they would tell me to question everything. Um, not question out of like, out of fight or angst or pushback, but more of like question everything because there's a lot out there that is filtered, that's filtered and it doesn't allow the truth to truly be seen, understood or learned. So NLP, I've just never been shown or guided to learn about it, but I've heard from many people who've seen me at events or have heard me speak, have said that I've, that apparently there's some similarities. Yeah, there is. There is. There's a few words you use, a few things you've just gestured or said, or the way you said, take yourself out of it, take yourself. There's that are very, um, they're very studied in NLP or very prone in NLP. One thing you said there, um, college, what was that moment that you were like, okay, you know what, this is not what uh, everybody else sees or everybody else feels truly. Was there something that brought it to your attention? Like, how did that change? Yeah. So I, I, I did mission trips. I went to, I was shown where I was going to go to college and to Christian college. And I was on a missions trip at Daytona beach and we were out one night and there was a guy that we saw who was, you could tell he was drunk, not fully drunk, but we started talking to him. And as soon as we walked up to him, I got a vision of him taking his life. You know, I saw the gun. I saw very detailed him shooting himself. And when I started, we started talking, I said to him, you know, were you planning on taking your life? And he just starts weeping and crying. And, and then I, I shared with him what I had seen, which is him taking his life. But then on, it's kind of like I get a vision and then there was a split vision. And on this side, I saw what his life would become if he chose to stay, which was this beautiful life in which he was going to fall in love be a dad, have children. So it's like, I got to see a preview of what 
he can choose instead. And it's interesting because in the vision and in the guidance, it's not like, oh, this is bad or this is good. It's like, okay, these are his choices. And it was being encouraged for me to present them to him. So when I told him, I said, if you choose to stay, this is what I see for you. And again, just weeping. And um, that conversation led him to actually want to join us. And, and he told us that he had the gun at the hotel. And that's what he was planning on doing that night after he was done partying. Um, and when that happened the next day, the, which all in his own good intentions, um, the leader of the group pulled me aside and said, you know, God doesn't talk to people like that. God doesn't give visions like that. Like pretty much how dare you, you should never do that again. Um, and even though we could tangibly see the positive effects, right. Um, I understand that in his own leadership of the group, it threatened a little bit of what was seen as adequate or appropriate. Um, but when that happened, when he said that to me, I wasn't like offended. I wasn't upset. It was more of a shock. Like I remember asking him a few times, like what you don't, you don't hear God. Like you don't see stuff. Like I was in shock because in that moment it was more of like, and I remember like, even after leaving that conversation, like checking in with other people, do you hear stuff? Do you see stuff? And it, it, it was more of like, it was more of a shock. Like how, how is it that I never knew this? Um, and after leaving that mission trip, it kind of put me in a different journey. I get chills everywhere um, into a different journey into understanding, well, how many people see and understand what I see. So it kind of, it was more of a journey of like asking friends and asking family and <laughs> more of that, like, okay, how long has this been going on? Um, and that helped me to understand that I was actually seeing and hearing stuff more than the normal. Where, where I had to ask, I mean, obviously this is probably years back. You said, this is, this is how old are you when this happened? The original first time college. So in your early twenties college. Yep. So it was, um, probably like 18, 19. So, okay. Mm -hmm. Where's that mindset that you obviously helped someone and he was against you passing that message what, what were what was his mindset with that that this is that you let allow god to do their work or like where was his mindset for being upset with that well you know i can't fully give his perspective right because i yeah. didn't in the moment didn't go into questioning that but my hallucination from just in hindsight now um is you're you're but, stepping over his leadership kind of stepping on his toes no but i think my hallucination is that all of us do this organically like all of us, you, me, when, when there's a part of us, when there's something outside of us that questions our beliefs, our identity, and what we hold onto as true. So I don't feel like he did it as like, oh, you're questioning my leadership, but it was like an authentic, like I was shaking the foundation of something he held so true to himself about how his God belief, and his beliefs and stuff. Okay. Yeah. Or at least that's, that's how I took it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. there's this part of me that also doesn't feel like it was personal because of that. Cause I think we all do that, you know? Yeah, 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 okay. I, I agree with that. With one thing you said before, Emily was um, with children, going back to children, mm -hmm. um, you questioned everything. Mm -hmm. And I think that's such a powerful tool. Like I, I get my kids to question everything. I've taught them that from day one, that mm -hmm. any situation you want to question to understand it to the fullest. And learn, I think one of the, such an important skill parents need to teach their children is learn how to ask questions. A lot mm -hmm. of parents will suppress kids from asking questions instead of teaching them how to ask the right questions. And where's your mindset with, with parents, like I said, suppressing children or pushing them aside from asking questions, like, oh, that's a dumb question. Like they don't allow them to fully express themselves and ask questions and, 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 and bring it to light and almost celebrate the kids asking lots of questions and being curious. Where's your mindset with that? Well, I think it's just the old paradigm in parenting, which that's shifting. I yeah. think our old paradigm, at least for me, my parents taught me not to question, right? Yeah. I say that. I say that, but my parents were also very open, you know, but I do remember moments in which it was like, well, because I told you so, like, you know, because you got to follow the rules. You got to make sure you're doing this at school, you know? Um, but I think there is this old paradigm, like a very, like we're talking about things being outdated in the school system. Well, 
I think the same applies with all systems, including our parenting style and things like that. And I think it's been evolving. You know, I think that there's this new wave of parenting model that's been, I would say the last decade, it's, it's starting to reveal itself a lot more um, that is encouraging parents to help children to be more present to following their own gut or following their own intuition, intuition, their <laughs> own, yeah, their own ability to, to like to question. And I think that's, that's part of what is also being seen in the school system, right? Why, why there is some challenge to that? Why there's more challenge, thank you, to what has been in the past. Let me say it like that. Um, but again, I just going back to your question, I think it's just a reflection again in an old, an old paradigm in parenting, which again, these kids are pushing us because a lot of these kids early on are questioning their parents, they're questioning, you know, and it's like there's this challenge. Um, but a lot of times what happens, or at least what I'm coming to see, and even when I was a teacher, is that their question is being followed up with, with words of wisdom or, or insights or a thought that kind of has whoever's listening kind of step back and be like, huh, <laughs> that's, that's a good thing to consider. That's something to consider, you know? Um, right. So there's, there's a different level of challenge that's coming up with the kids and parenting as well, which is having us question ourselves, right? Question the way that we're parenting as well. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but that's, that's no, how you did, it did. So with, with, with parenting nowadays, um, I'm a strong believer in, in, in putting certain things, I call them non-negotiables. So mm -hmm. my schedule, I have non-negotiables. I'm home from, <coughs> sorry, I got a dry throat. I'm home from three to six, no matter what, every day, I try to be home from three to six, and that's my non-negotiable. That's locked to my schedule. That's dinner time. I try to have dinner with my kids every night. So there's certain things I do that try to be there for their activities, their sports, taking them, picking them up from school. Um, I'm I'm obviously being self-employed allows me the freedom to bring them to school, pick them up, do a lot of things that some people that have a nine to five job aren't able to do. Mm -hmm. And but I make sure I put it into my non-negotiables into my schedule every day, every every single month, and and it's locked in there. A lot of you hear entrepreneurs because you always work with entrepreneurs and, and I've been an entrepreneur for 26 years now. You always hear it's, it's hard to have that balance, that magic word with balance. You hear Gary Vee and all these huge entrepreneurs saying there's no such word as balance. I'm the opposite. I, I, I truly believe that you could have balance. Mm -hmm. I believe that you could find a harmony between a busy life schedule. I, I run right now four corporations. We're doing rentals. We're, we're everywhere, but I still... I never miss my kids' events. I'm they're always for my kids. I drive them to school. So you could find that balance. And there's certain sacrifices you have to do. I'm up at 4.30 every morning, not because I like to. I, I'm not one of those aha, get up in the morning guys. I do it because I realize if I sacrifice myself, I'm up at 4.30. By the time 9 a.m. comes around, I've already done most of my work for the day. And it allows me the freedom to do a podcast and talk to you and, and do other stuff during the day that I, that I enjoy, right? So where's let's start off with balance. Where's your mindset with the word balance between entrepreneurs or business owners and parenting? Um, again, another great question. Like, I love this. That's one thing when I start working with someone right away, it's like, I, um, I help them to identify and understand. Cause I think that that's part of um, same thing, an old paradigm, you know, success working, you know, getting things done. It's like a lot of that mindset comes from corporate and it's like seated over and it's like it's seated down along the way with people who like started as the first people who started like branching out of the corporate and going out on their own. And it's kind of like it's so much is adopted from the corporate world. Um, and I think, again, that's part of the old paradigm. But balance and non-negotiables. I love that you said non-negotiables because even my kids hear me say that, like, this is a non-negotiable, you know, with regards to our time, with regards to certain things that we agree to as a family. So I love that you do that as well. But balance and and I think it's it's crucial and key. And I think that people, when they start a business or are growing a business, they fail to start with first identifying the lifestyle that they want to create. Yeah. Right. Like if we could just start there, the lifestyle and the lifestyle most of the time gets put last, right? So then it's like people are trying to catch up to squeeze in the lifestyle, which is why they feel so unbalanced. That's why they feel tapped out. That's why they feel over, you know, it's like burned out. 
when, if in reality, if they can just start here, like, again, once I, when I work with someone, it's like, that's our first step. And then from there, understanding that it doesn't have to fall under specific rules. Like, that's why we're entrepreneurs, right? Because we are meant to give voice to how we want things to look, not the rules that have been passed down from generations or from whatever other ways yeah. they are passed down. Um, and my hallucination, what I've come to see from myself and other people that I've worked with is that we can shape shift into creating what we want if we just decide we can create it. And yeah. for me personally, I have certain days of the week that are a non-negotiable committed to certain things and, 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 and ways that I want to grow. Right. So that there's, there's a way that I set up my schedule to make sure balance is part of it. I'm very present in my kids' lives, like since day one, you know, it's like, I'm very present. And it hasn't impacted my success. And I've met people that they say like, it's not balanced. I don't have time for this. It's like, so it's kind of like, there's a, you're saying the word deprivation and uh, I'm hearing the word, uh, or de 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 uh, I'm being shown someone who's really thirsty, right? They're, they feel dehydrated. They feel yes. like, you know, so it's like, they fail to identify that balance should have been decided upon first. Yeah. yeah. Right. And again, there's different people can look at it. You know, I'm sure there's people who would argue with me like, no, no, you should hustle, hustle and make it work first. But I just come from experience and working with people that when you're able to identify the balance and non-negotiables. and I, I think people are, are, are want, but aren't willing to sacrifice to get what they want. Yes. And I think yes. that's the biggest issue, right? I mean, it, it, it's, it's, you could hustle all day and work your rear off and get, be successful and put the extra hours in. But you might have to sacrifice and, and work a couple hours when the kids go to bed. You might have to be up at 430. You might have to sacrifice on weekends. It's learning what has to be sacrificed in order to achieve what you truly want. And I, and I go, I, I do something very similar to people that I work with is, and, and I have a, a handful of clients I coach. I don't like coaching a lot of people. I just have a handful of clients I coach. And what I look at is, is, is the first thing is what, how do they measure wealth? and making them understand that the second thing i try to do is is what you hear 80 90 percent of the time when somebody's on their deathbed the regrets they have mm -hmm. and i start looking down and breaking up if something were to happen to you today how would you want to be remembered are you living that life to the fullest mm -hmm. and and i look at that and i say okay what are, what things if something were to happen to you today what things do you feel like you would regret have you made a phone call to that loved one? Have you reached out to those friends? Are you doing the things you like? Is there certain things in your life you've always dreamed about doing, whether racing a car or go, it could be anything. Mm -hmm. And are you actually finding time to fit those things in? So I look at it as, is, is where do you measure wealth? Because you know, we need money to do many things that we love. It's just how are you going to accomplish to get that money? And then allow it to enjoy that time that or that freedom that that money brings, right? So a lot of people, once they start getting a certain amount of money, they enjoy that the prize that comes with that money, but they don't now and start enjoying the freedom that came with that money. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. You know, and and thank you for sharing. One of the things that I'm, are you okay if I share something real? Hundred percent. With this. Um, what I've come to witness, and, and it's exactly what you're you're saying. It's like if, if we can get clear and identifying the belief structures, right, that are present about success, money, wealth. If we can get clear with that, and then identify well, what beliefs actually need to be adopted that will help you reinforce balance, wealth, expansion, right, in a in a way that doesn't have you sacrificing in unhealthy ways. Yeah. So that's what I'm getting because what I've come to realize, and I'm sure you see this, is like when people can redesign their belief system in a healthier way, what happens is that they get more productive. So what could have taken them, and I hear this from people all the time, clients all the time. They're like, I don't know how you did it, but I actually feel like I have more time. Yeah, yeah. But when we reframe, when we reconstruct whatever belief systems have us um, sacrificing in unhealthy ways because we believe that's the only way and that's what needs to happen. When it gets reguided and, and, and um, I'm hearing the word reinvented and, into an empowering way to create, right? To um, thank you, to promote growth. <laughs> they're saying growth and they're showing me money. Um, when we can do that, what happens is that the mind and the intellect works for us in a different way.
right? Energy, emotions, yeah. motivation works for us in a different way. So what happens is that productivity gets compounded, right? We kind of quantum leap results that could have taken us maybe two, three, five years. But when we re redesign our own landscape of how we see wealth success and what's possible, we're able to compound and, and multiply our results in ways that we couldn't have ever been able to create or step into or perceive with the old belief systems that were driving the car the whole, the whole way, right? It's like, it, it would change things drastically. Where's your mindset? And I, and I brought this up a couple of minutes ago is um, with living with no regrets. Mm. Gosh. Cause I'm, 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 I'm all over that. And I'll explain it in, in after why, why, why I'm all over that. But where's your mindset with that? Well, it's, it's funny. It's like, I feel like it's a motto. All of us should be living and adopting because the reality is we don't, I mean, it's kind of like, I'm saying something, everybody knows who's listening. It's like, we really don't know when our last breath is. And, um, I've, I've taught this to my kids, teachers to my daughter, who's, you know, 19 is different because she can't communicate and understands life differently. But my 18 year old, my five-year-old, and I, I live it that way. And I show it with it through my example. It's so, you know, I had a heart attack in 2019. And I, I felt like you, before you had a heart attack in 2019, I had a heart attack 2019. So before that I lived life with no regret. Like I was so committed to making sure I showed up. My dad was a great example of that. And he taught us as kids. Um, but at when I, when 2019 happened, I actually felt no regret other than wanting to spend more time with my kids and my loved ones, you know, and and again, I think that that's ultimately what happens when we're confronted with the idea of death and not just conceptually, but like we're, we're living it, you know, we're having an experience that has us really look at it. And it kind of reminded me again, why life required more of me um, and being very mindful and attentive about what I was creating, not just in my business, but what I was creating with my family and with myself. Um, so living life in the regrets, I think that that's, it's an anthem that on some level can change so much of our trajectory as, as a, and I say this as a collective, because all of us living life without regrets is going to look very different for everyone, right? Yeah. Like it's going to look so different. And for some people, unfortunately is going to be, I mean, I hate admitting this, but it's like for some people that can look very dark. And for some people that can look very expansive and beautiful and, and life-giving, right? So I think that um, it's about identifying what that looks like to us and for us and, and doing the best that we can, responding to life in a way that helps us step into that. I, I love that you said doing the best we can, because reality is, and I'll, and I'll explain why I'm saying this, is you could live with no regrets, but there always are regrets. I'm a strong believer, no matter who you are, you're going to have regrets. There's certain things you wish you did, certain things people you wish you called, certain people you wish you saw. And, and why am I saying this? And I'm, I'm very vocal about it. And I, I talk about it all the time on the podcast. My dad, um, going on to February 8th, February 7th, will be um, nine months he passed away. And uh, I was the 44, I, I should turn 45 now, but I was the 44-year-old that would call my dad three times a day. We would talk every morning to work. I would talk to him middle of the day and I would call him every night to say goodnight to him. And then I would see him on a regular basis. I made sure my, my, my kids were always with him. And I spent so much time with my dad, but it was, it was sudden. It was, um, I talked to him on, uh, May, uh, May 6th at uh, 10 PM. Say goodnight to him. I got a call, uh, May 7th, 6 a.m., he fell in front of my mom and died on the spot, had a massive heart attack and died. And 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 I had that. And, and from there on, there's this, and it's till this day, I still have that that feeling inside me. There was so much more I wanted to say to him and do with him. Mm -hmm. So, and, th and this is coming from a guy, like I said, like I spent so much time with him. I did so much with him. I go to car shows. I would always come by my work. Like we're always together, but you still have regrets. So when I hear people especially friends of mine, when I hear them being, Oh, I didn't, oh, I'm not going to go see my parents this weekend. I'll, I'll see you next weekend. Or I'll do this. I, I, it just angers me because you don't know what is coming the unexpected mm -hmm. and those regrets will haunt you forever. So, 
Um, I'm, I'm very, I've always been very passionate about living with no regrets, but I think I've now is taking it to a different level, different level to 2022. I'm doing things. I'm setting things that I don't know why I'm doing them, but I'm doing them. Uh, I, I've, I've, I'm 45 and I just turned 45 the other day and I've always wanted to get my gun license. I don't know why, but I set it up and I'm going to go do it in the next couple of months. I always wanted to do some car racing. I've set up lessons. So I'm doing these things. I'm blocking in these extra things this year for things that I've, I've been procrastinating for years, say I'm going to do it. And now I'm like, you know what? I'm at that age right now. And I'm lucky financially. I'm at a comfortable spot in my life that I could do these things. And I'm like, stop procrastinating, just do them. And, and I think a lot of people need to start living that way. A lot of people need to start understanding that nothing's guaranteed tomorrow's not guaranteed so live to the fullest do what you can to keep yourself happy and and also fill your cup up mm-hmm. i mean that whole oprah mindset of filling your cup up first start it, you need to fill your cup up for yourself and and if you're constantly filling everybody else's cup you're not living to your full potential too right so mm-hmm. um yeah that's my mindset with with uh living with no regrets so i give you my little two cents there too no it's great and you know, it's interesting because um, I'm audibly hearing, if you're okay, if I share this, yeah. and I just realized I'm going to have to put my my computer on the charger. I'm so sorry to do this while we're interviewing. Oh, no worries. Um, but one of the things that I'm audibly hearing is like, that's part of the gift that our children are helping us to understand. Yeah. The gift of the moment. You know, we both have children that can be labeled by the majority of society as disabled or, you know, having limitations and disabilities. And, you know, my daughter... She can't talk, but she's truly helped me to understand and own the gift of the moment. You know, she savors every moment. She's happy. You know, it's like, she's literally happy. Yeah. I don't know if you've heard a few times we're talking, she's laughing, (laughs) you know, it's like, she's just, and I think part about life, living life without regrets. um, Yes. It's about doing those things. Like you mentioned. And again, I am so sorry. um, Doing these things that you're mentioning. But I think that we also, there's a gift, there's a portal we can enter with life when we could also, also savor the moment we're in, right? The life we're in, the, the gift and what can be experienced in the now. And I'm sure you see that with your son, you know, it's like, he's aiming for things and he wants to, like you, you mentioned the marathon and like, yeah, he's going for things. But I'm sure that you probably can see within him how he does savor the moments with you, right? It's like just... Just oh, he's, himself. he's daddy, daddy's little boy. I mean, he is, he, he will not go to bed without coming and give me a hug and a kiss. He wakes up in the morning. The first thing he does, he has to run to my room and give me a hug and a kiss. He's like the sweetest little <laughs> angel. Yes. And, uh, I, I call him my little puppy. And when I come home, it's either him. It's a race between him and my, in my lab to the front oh. door. Who's going to come see me first. Right. <laughs> it. So it's, uh, and then it's, it's crazy. Cause I have a daughter, my daughter's 15. And, and she's the pure opposite. She's, we talked about, she's gifted. She's hundred percent straight A student, high performance dance. She's just, everything came easy to her. Mm-hmm. Anything she does comes so easy to her, mm. but she's also this almost like kindred spirit. She's just sweet little angel. And she does things subconsciously to help others that, and she doesn't realize them that other people are acknowledging them. I'll give you an example. Um, she graduated, she's in grade 10 now, but she graduated grade eight during the, the peak of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. So she was, she had the, like, like all the schools in Toronto, Canada, they all got shut down. She was doing her homeschooling. Um, and uh, so she graduated. Um, life was crazy. We spent a lot of more attention towards my son um, for his schooling and stuff. And it came time for her graduation. It was all virtual. So we had her family over, we had a couple of people. It was live on, we put the, we put the laptop, hooked it up to TV, we're watching. And it was a, it was a virtual quote unquote graduation grade eight, which really sucked because she really wanted to um, have a proper graduation from grade eight. And the principal comes on, he's, and, and, and she's talking and she goes to the point where she's giving awards out. And, um, and uh, the first thing they did was honor roll. She got honor roll. We weren't even aware that she's on her honor roll. She's been on the honor roll for now, and even high school, the last first two years of high school too. She was on honor roll. So we're all excited and happy. And we're like, wow, wow. Well. And then it came to um, one of the last presentations for the evening. And they said, and the principal was talking. She's like, this is a very special one. We've been watching this young lady for the last couple of years. And it's a sibling award. 
for somebody that, I don't remember the name of it, but somebody that stands out and takes care of their sibling and puts their sibling first. And she won it, uh-huh. which is hard to write because we've put so much attention and energy towards my son that sometimes I feel guilty. I feel like we've left, we don't give her the full attention she needs because I'm like, she's okay. She, she could do it on her own. Mm-hmm. And at the same time too, that is not, I mean, some children who push that away and, and not be almost in a way focus on themselves, not their, their sibling. And she mm-hmm. realized how much her brother needed her. And she put so much attention, even at school, and no one's there seeing it to help her brother and the teachers are recognizing, which is so mm-hmm. amazing. Right. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, as much as I, I guess we've done something right with her, she's doing, she's doing well, but it's, 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 it's amazing where, um, she recognized that at such a young age and, and, and it just, it was subconsciously, she just, it was, it wasn't even anybody telling her to do what she was doing on her own, which is pretty special. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's, it, as you're talking, it's like that acknowledgement and celebration of our children. Gosh, they're such amazing teachers, right? It's like, we think we're like guiding and supporting them, but they're like teaching and guiding us way more um, than we realize, you know, uh, you know, she has a, my, 19 year old, the one who's disabled has her sister who's 18. And, um, I remember one day a friend had offered to publish her book and we were driving and I was like, Oh, you know, he's offering to publish your book and, and, you know, for you to write a book. And, and, and she goes, well, I don't know what I would write about. And I gave her some suggestions and I said, even just, even you could even write a book about your sister, you know, cause my daughter Isabella has, I mean, since she was more and you know she was probably more around two and three and on she was in the ambulance she was in the, in the hospital you know helping with her sister but she she grew up so quick and I had the same I've had those moments like what you say it's like I wish I would have had more accessibility with my time and energy especially when Caitlin was having so many traumatic experiences right so many emergencies for me to be able to be there for her so I said, well, why don't you write a book about your experience as, as a sister of a, you know, of Caitlin and the challenges. I said the challenges and all that stuff that were part of it. And with everything that played out in, in our lives, she said, I said, I don't see it as a challenge. She's yeah. like, she's like, it's helped me to be who I am today. And yeah. she's like, I'm very happy with who I am. Like, I love my life. Yeah. I love everything about my life. And it was so it was perfect, but also the, just that, I don't know, just reminder, especially with, with our situation, it's like, as parents, we do our best, right? But there's this level of mastery within our children that we may not see right away, but eventually we get glimpses of it. And that was a moment for me with her, which it seems it was the same with your daughter. It's like, like, this is what I, you know, it's like, I've got this, this is what I came for, you know, this is what actually helped me be who I need to be. Just like with your daughter, it's exactly what's probably made her so successful and in, in, in her academics. And I'm sure even just who she is as a young woman. Yeah. So it's just beautiful. Yeah, she's Thank pretty, you. For she's pretty, she's pretty, uh, yeah, she's pretty amazing kid. She's 15 mm-hmm. years old. I mean, this kid cooks, cleans. She's a little <laughs> machine, man. She's an absolute little machine. One thing that you said, and, and, and they were constantly learning off her children. And I think that's so valid. I've, I've been told so many times of people that know me, like I'm, I'm so driven when it comes to business, when I'm, 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 when I put my head to doing something, it's done. And, and I've written a couple of books and I got the podcast and I run a couple of companies. My main company um, is a company called Camor, where we've had uh, just past 16 years. Uh, we design and manufacture boxing, martial art equipment. That's our main brand. So mm-hmm. I do that. I do a bunch of stuff. And I was told so many times by people that, um, Tiago, I always hear this, that uh, Tiago was very lucky to have me as a dad because I'm so driven. I was meant to be his dad. And it's like the opposite. Like he was mm-hmm. meant to be my son. He's totally changed me as a man, as a father, mm-hmm. um, made me really appreciate the sit back and, and the little stuff, the little stuff that we celebrate. I mean, I remember it took three months for him to hop on one foot and we do it every single day for two, three hours to practice to hop on one foot. Now this kid's doubled on one foot, jumping, jumping two, three steps at a time. And 
Okay. It was that it was those celebrations. We would set these goals and put them all over his bedroom wall. And this is how much we want to weigh, or this is how much you want to, he plays. He's very, it's funny. You said that about um, baseball. We talked about before we on, he's, he's a little lefty pitcher and he's obsessed with baseball. And he has this, these goals that he wants to throw us ball at by a certain, he always sets these goals of speed and all this stuff. And, 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 and once he sets them, it just, his mindset is just, he will not stop till he gets them. And I'm like, how, how does a, a 13 year old have that drive. And I think it's, it's, he doesn't know no other way. Hmm. Right. It was just like he, that struggle from such a young age has taught him to be relentless. Mm -hmm. And I use that word. Like I, I I literally have that word tattooed on my wrist, relentless, Mm because it's such a powerful word that subconsciously his, his desire to quote unquote, our society to be normal Mm -hmm is pushed him to be so relentless to fit in. And now his relentless behavior, he realizes that it's, it's subconsciously it's inside him. Now that the harder I push myself, I don't have to be average. I can be better than average. Mm -hmm. And he's surpassing kids that he like base. I'll give you an example. When he's first played baseball, his first trial for a rep team. Um, uh, that time he was still wearing, um, AFL braces, but he wouldn't wear it. Like he would take them off and wouldn't wear them to pre- try any training or anything like that. And he went for tryouts and from home to first out of, I think the kids were like 40 something kids to try out for that team. He was, I think the second or third slowest and obsessed, obsessed. He went the next year for tryouts and he was the fourth fastest on the team. And, wow. and it's just that mindset of just once he's locked in, it's just unbelievable where he gets accomplished. But it, I think that's, that's something where we're all like that. I think we just don't know how to push within ourselves and how to be able to push that out of ourselves. And I think that's why you see the achievers and people that never really achieve what they should be able to achieve. So where's your mindset of breaking that, breaking out of that for people? So I want to answer your question, but yeah. if you don't mind, I'm, I'm hearing something that I want to just share real quick. Yeah. Um, and I think what I'm understanding, cause I'm hearing the word, um, you know, they learn to use life's resources in a different way. Yeah. You know, and it's like, uh, your son, even my daughter, even though she has her own limitations, she's learned to use life's resources in a different way. And when we're normal or healthy or, um, fit in what is, Okay, let's say it like that. Um, we we ultimately subscribe to the limitations and how to use life and how to use life's resources, right? And these children and individuals that have these limitations, they have no other choice but use to use life's resources in a different way, which push them and us into witnessing more of what's possible, right? through their limitations, through their perceived limitations. But um, just have to speak to that because I was audibly hearing that. And I'm like, yeah, I like that. It's, I resonate. And, and, and I'll give you an example of that. My son, um, he had seven organs that were, um, that were uh, damaged at birth. And, um, and uh, part of his brain was damaged. And his brain learned to create new highways, mm. create new paths. So he was supposed to be genetically or whatever you want to call it, right-handed. But he, because that part of his brain affected his whole right side of his body from a very young age, um, he had a lot of difficulty even holding a pen or pushing anything. So, I mean, over the years, now he's fully balanced and we've got him fully balanced and he's doing everything with both sides. But he learned how to do everything with his left. Mm. And now he's a left-handed pitcher and his body adapted subconsciously. Like I said, one of the things he didn't, it didn't think of it. He just started picking up things with the left thing. Hey, I, I, I'll learn how to do it with my left from a very young mm. age. And he learned how to do everything with his left. Now he actually does, he does everything with both hands, which is pretty amazing, but he really dominated, like plays sports. Everything is left hand, throws a ball, left hand, kicks left foot. And it's, it's, it's amazing when you're saying exactly, they, they've taken whatever resource they have and adapted to create whatever their path is through that, through, through their own ability. Right. Which is pretty amazing how resilient kids are. And I don't think we give credit to that. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's, and it's interesting. Like, you know, you ask your questions, like, how do you get people past that? Um, it's a great question. Cause I think 
my hallucination is that that's an that's 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 a question that applies uniquely to each individual, right? Because all of us have such a different driving force. Um, and of course, we can say that collectively we have similar driving forces, you know, but um, the reality is that we we all are so wired so differently. Um, for me, when I've worked with people, you know, I like to say it's like, how, how do I wake up their fire, right? That's the question. Like, how do I wake up someone's fire? And, and a lot of times what I've come to witness is that it's, it's outside the logic. When I look at it from my perspective, this may not be exactly the, but it's like, from my perspective, the way that I work with people as an intuitive coach, it's like, I, I, I like to see what is their, what is their fire? What is, what is, um, and a deeper, I know this just in a deeper way, what fuels their soul, right? What, what fuels their, their momentum that might even be outside the logic? Because the reality is, unfortunately, my hallucination is that most people don't know what that is. They've become- I would, I would, I would, I would 100% agree with that. They've become so inundated with their normal, with their stories, with their life, with their expectations and rules that- most of them don't know that, you know, and I think as coaches, you know, you and I, our role is to help people find that greater fire, that greater why, that greater thing that can pull and move someone into seeing life outside of what they've known. And unfortunately, again, most people don't have that until, until, until life does a favor and gives them something and throws something at them that gives them no other choice but to wake up you know COVID has been like that for us as a collective yeah you know um sometimes it's I, I call it I call it a trigger point right mm-hmm. yes yeah. Yeah. I, and I think that's that's the issue with a lot of um is that is that aha moment that moment when it's like okay like like what are you going to do you put in a corner right and I think a lot of people even if they go through that moment, they kind of shift away from it. They, 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 they push away from it. They don't challenge it face on and, 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 and challenging something face on like that allows you to really find who you are, right? How strong you are, how, how strong your will is, how strong your passion is, how, what your passion is. I mean, like, like anything, I mean, when, when my son was, um, this is a true story. When my when we, we were discharged from the hospital, he was diagnosed diagnosed with um, uh, several palsy, and uh, they gave the release papers, and they wanted me to sign off what his diagnosis was. Mm. And and I didn't even I I knew I I knew a lot about what several palsy was, and and the outcomes, but I I, I didn't want that label to foresee my son's future. I don't know if that makes any sense. So I'm trying to say, so in my mind was, I was not going to allow a doctor looking at a four month old and tell me what his future was going to be. And I actually ripped up those papers till this day. I ripped up those papers and I didn't sign them. And I, and I walked out with our son on the discharge day and, and I could have easily just allowed myself to reform to what the doctor said and just been like, okay, it is what it is. We got to live with it. And, and just followed the path where many parents follow. And I was the opposite where I was like, okay, day one, let's find every resource we can. Let's find every educational book we can. Let's find every study we can. And let's figure out what we need to trigger where it's light therapy, whether it's, I mean, I, I would spend hours with my son, just pushing his fingers through plaster scene. Mm-hmm. And and I, and I adapted to figuring out what we needed to do on our part to give him this best outcome. Didn't know the future. Didn't know his outcome. I didn't know. No way in the world we'd ever thought he'd come to where he is today. And, but at the same time too, I didn't allow somebody else's perception of what my son was going to be kind of foresee his future. I don't know if that makes any sense. So I think a lot of people put themselves inside that box mm-hmm. or what society pushed them inside and they don't know how to get out of it. Mm-hmm. Or they just 
like like sheep just follow that path right so i think it's 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 the trailblazers the people that are just that live outside the box that just say like i'm not gonna i'm not gonna listen to you i'm gonna do what i gotta do to to give myself the best option are the ones that lead the way but i think a lot of people sometimes need that like you said by yourself need that push or that guidance just to, to open up their eyes or that moment in life just to hit them to give them to find that that clarity right you know, and as you were talking, and thank you, by the way, for sharing, I, I just celebrate you and acknowledge and just, you know, bow down to you as a father for showing up like that for your son, because I, it's beautiful and powerful. And I think also just people who might be hearing this story, it's like, even just our normal children, that's just, and I hate saying the word normal, but you know yeah. what I mean, like, right? It's like, as parents, that's, that's part of our role. And they're saying fire. It's like, I feel like it's, it's, it's a fire that most parents have not given themselves permission to own and feed, which is like, there's too much that gets given to us too many expectations rules or child should be doing this, not doing this. Right. Or depending on what their condition is, how it should look like. And I think part of one of our purpose as parents is to not, not be part of the presence in our child's life that tells them to conform, you know, yeah. and, and I want to yeah. celebrate that you did that. Um, but one of the things that they kept playing out as you were talking, I, with one of my clients, I just we had a call. The conversation took place last week. <laughs> That's why they're, they're jumping me, taking me back to time and taking me last week. And part of what they kept saying is that he really needed to own that he was live. He's in a cage. And it wasn't like they were, having him not appreciate the life he was in but having him understand that ultimately most of us can very quickly and easily put ourselves in a cage with our expectations again with our stories and our rules and part of our the soul's purpose our soul's purpose is to get us out of that cage right like all of us on a soul will come into this life saying, I am not going to get into that cage, right? I'm not going to conform. I'm not, and it's not even out of fighting, but there's so much about our collective and our society that has us trying to fit in and, and trying to be so much part of what's acceptable that it does mute so much of what's possible. And again, this is my own perception. It doesn't mean it's right but they kept bringing me back to that conversation with that client, which was a little extreme. I, I will say it's not, this is not how they talk to everyone. Yeah. Um, but they were telling him like, part of the gift right now is that you just need to sit with the idea that you are in a cage, right? But it was like, they were bringing him to that place so that he can decide like, I can't, like, I want to get out of I it. I can choose to stay in it. I can choose to stay in it no matter how, pretty it looks right or I can choose to actually understand that I'm in a cage and I can get out of it right it's like yeah. that and I, I feel like part of what's happening and what they're saying to this is that life ultimately always tries to bring that perspective to us like life challenges or life like it's because it's trying to wake us up into seeing that there is limitation within the four walls that we're living or perceiving life not always there's yeah. people like you and I who are very introspective and push and we explore and we, you know what I mean? It's like, we're, we're expanding in all different directions, but I think the majority of people don't live life that way. And I don't mean to be in judgment of it. That's not what I'm trying to do at all, but that's I think. true. I mean, people don't live life to their fullest potential. I mean, that's just, that, that'll go on forever. I mean, as much as you, we could preach it. I mean, that's going to go on forever. People get into their routines. I mean, that's the simplest way to break it down is the routines, right? They finish school, they go to college, they go to university, they get their college tuition, they have to pay it back, they get a nine to five job, they wake up, they go to work, they're miserable, they come home, they put out, they have their dinner upon Netflix, start the next day. And that's what they live their lives. Mm -hmm. And on weekends, they celebrate it by hanging out or they think, okay, it's the weekend come times. Anybody that has that mindset that this is my this is my mindset anybody has a mindset where they're looking at the weekend as a a time that like oh my god it's the weekend mm -hmm. is living not living to their fullest mm -hmm. 
I mean, I'm the mindset where it's like Monday is like, oh, let's go work time. I, I get excited to start things, to, to build things, to try new things. And to me, there is no weekend. It's just, we got your seven days a week and what are we going to make the most out of every single day, right? But a lot of people, they have that, they, they become numb. And that's that's where society puts you in that box. And, and, and once you're stuck in that box, it's hard to break out of that system. Mm-hmm. Whether you, but you got bills, you got mortgages, it's hard to start your own business. It's hard to, to break through. It's hard once you have a family, you have kids, you got responsibilities, you got food to put on the table. And, and, and mm-hmm. that goes all the way back to living with no regrets. Mm-hmm. Because most people, when they do realize what has come about their life or how they're living, sometimes it's a little too late at that point to really do the things they always wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Yes. And thank you for sharing that. I'm audibly hearing, and they, they said it. And I'm like, oh, so I went like that because um, and they were talking about rules, like, and I, I and I recognize that this is something we're similar, and I'm sure a lot of your listeners are similar in this. Is that there is a part of of certain individuals soul mission or vision or or what they're defining as life being free of the rules right it's like there are no rules Mm -hmm. there are no rules but i think that part of that challenge if we are people who are choosing to live in the idea that there's no rules i can create and do whatever i choose to it's kind of like checking in as well periodically i mean i do this i do this once a year right once a year and i actually do it more than once a year but when i once a year where i'm like diving deep And I'm like soul searching, like what is hiding inside me that is holding on to a belief, idea, a rule that is keeping me from my next, right? And without fail, something always shows up. But that's part of my commitment, right? It's like if I'm choosing to live outside of normal rules, then I have to ultimately understand that there's a dualistic part of our experience, right? We're human. So ultimately, ultimately, unfortunately, we are going to lean into rules and stories and beliefs, right? And it's like, it's a requirement to kind of check in and step in and check in, not just once or twice, but like as often as possible so that we can re-guide them. I, 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 I do it every, and sometimes every eight weeks, sometimes every three months max is I almost dissect mm-hmm. what is happening in my life. And then what I do is I call the breakthrough part where it's like, I almost, this is, these are the moments where I look at and I analyze work um, relationships, especially work and stuff. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll analyze what things in my life or what things am I doing in my life personally, business wise, family that don't need to be there. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times we become numb to them and you, and they're just there and we just do them because we're so used to doing them, the routine and they don't have to be there. And all of a sudden we clear ourselves, we, we eliminate these things from our, our schedule and you realize the freedom it allows. Yeah. And I also do that with individuals in my life. Every three months, I look at a list and, and, and certain people in my life, I'm like, do I really need these people in my life? And it's okay, let's, let's lead them out of my life. And I'm not, doesn't mean I'm never going to talk to them again, but this point in my life, they're not doing anything that are going to benefit or bring me joy or happiness, or there's nothing I could add to their life at that point. Mm -hmm. So when I realize that by eliminating certain people or limiting certain things from my schedule, you allow yourself this freedom. And all of a sudden you got this open time that you could do something you really enjoy, or you could just, whether it's even just being by yourself, Mm -hmm. I think having those moments where you're just by yourself Mm -hmm. is so like right now, we're, um, I say we, I, I'm, I'm in the process of building out a, a beach house about three hours from here mm, nice. and I'm um, in a place called Savile beach. And, um, I, I picked it up as a 1970s cottage. Um, it was supposed to be a little quick reno. I ended up doing a full gut to it. I'm pretty handy. So I do a lot of this stuff myself. Mm-hmm. I'm up there two times a week, sometimes three times a week. I, I'm great. Cause all my, my, my other companies have got great staff. Everybody's doing amazing. So it allows me to free them to be up there, but I'm up there. I was up there. I drove for two and a half hours. I did about eight or nine hours of tiling yesterday, a bathroom, mm-hmm. but the music blaring, I'm by myself. And to me, that it's, it's, I need that time for myself every once in a while. And I enjoy it. I enjoy that freedom of just being by myself 
and and I didn't turn on my, I had my phone pretty much just on, on, on vibrate all day. I didn't pick up any calls, didn't check social media, didn't do anything. And, and it was just a day for myself. And even though I worked all day, it didn't feel like work because it was just myself doing something for myself, doing something I enjoy. So I think a lot of people really finding that time for themselves is very important. And the only way to do that, I find is really dissecting or analyzing what you're currently doing and realizing what things you can eliminate from your schedule or what people you can eliminate that are, that are stopping you from having that time for yourself. Yes, 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 yes. And I'm audibly being encouraged. Um, and thank you for sharing. Cause there are several thoughts that came up as you were talking. Um, what I'm being encouraged to share is like, like when I do this, which again, I check in more than just once a year to do this, but when I do this in my year and they're saying to include this part of it, because it is, it does change so much, or at least for me, it has changed so much when I've done it with people. It's like, I take, I pull out everything, right? So this is again, like a one, two, three day process. Like I'm just in my portal silence by myself. And then what happens is, is that then I ask, well, what can I map out now free of these limitations, right? Free of these setbacks. Like what can I map out now compared to what I've been mapping? And it's always neat because I think that that's what's helped me and supported me in so many ways. And even with my clients, it's like evolving, even my vision, right. Evolving, even the outdated colors and and reflections or representations of my vision that, that served the me that were really part of last year. Right. It's like, it's like that delicious evolution of, of what life is asking us to create free of all those limitations. And it's always blows my mind that, when I'm done mapping out this compared to this, it's just, it, it's, it's, it just amazes me. But just with what you were saying, like, even if that was done, even if, it, you know, in every way possible, like taking time to then acknowledge, so, wow, now that this has been done, who now have I become or what now gets to get created because it, it fuels the fire differently, right? It fuels the focus differently. And what I was saying earlier, what they or, or encouraged me to identify, identify is that productivity gets quantified, right? Things. I, I, res- sorry, sorry. I gotta, I, so I got to jump in there. Something you said, mm-hmm. who have I become? I think that's powerful because I think we're always constantly evolving and changing. How do you really come to an understanding of that and, and, and how often do you really I think it's something we don't really pay much attention to but it's something that like when you said it it first came to my head I'm like who am I who have I become the last year like you're constantly changing and growing um you're constantly learning I'm a strong believer the day you die the day you stop learning you got to constantly be learning every day how do you or where do you come to an understanding of who you've become and when and, 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 and how you're cha- constantly changing. How do you, because a lot of people, like they said, they, they put themselves in, the, in that cage and they're constantly the same person. They don't allow themselves to evolve. Even though they are evolving, maybe they won't even acknowledge the evolvement, if that makes sense. How do you change that? You know, so some of the things that I do for me in a visual sense, you know, I, I, I actually even look at my old pictures, like, well, how did I look last year compared to who I look now? And I play with that idea, right? It's like, how, how, how do I hold myself different? How do I look different? How do I show up different? So that that's a visual reflection that this kind of adds the playfulness to it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I can celebrate that even though I'm getting older every year, I see more of my youth, ironically, yeah. in my I, pictures. I, I, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Yeah, I feel that's yeah. very much so, yeah. So that's one thing I do. Um, I also take time to look at my old journal like what I was journaling then and what I'm journaling now and how much my languaging has evolved, how much my perception has evolved. And I take time to just witness that for myself. And then because, um, and authentically this started when I started going on a date with destiny. So I create a whole date with destiny, you know, the whole plan that I learned a date with destiny. So I've been very blessed because I've gone already five years. So that's been something more, more recent five years, you know, um, where I kind of look at what my board looked every year, right? Okay. This, my board looked like this year and my board looks like how different it looks now compared to what I was a year ago. And then lastly, I, I like to do what I call is my map. 
And they've taught me this for a long time where it's like, I asked to be shown the map for my year. And it's interesting because I, I journaled on this this morning because I, I do self, I, I coach myself once a week. Like I do my clients, like I, I asked to be shown and, and guided. And one of the things that they said this morning, which was so good. Um, let me see if I can pull it up real quick. I don't want to take, but, um, and they were, they were telling me like, they were pretty much guiding me like they do in the beginning in, in the year and the, and they said reverse engineer is the audible word I kept hearing. Right. So when you're saying, how do you evolve? Um, I like to check in, like, how did I, if I was to, so I do this meditation too. So if I was to go back to myself a year from now, how would I tell her to reverse engineer what I've accomplished, right? Reverse engineer, like, how did I do it so that she knows where to go and how to make it happen? Um, so that's another way I check in my evolution because I see that the way I look at it is very different. And I honestly believe that just that little time that I take to just bless my old self and give her insights, you know, I do this whole meditation exercise that I'm empowering my 2021 self to become who she needs to be for the 2022 self, right? So that's part of my process. But what I audibly kept hearing this morning in my coaching, my self-coaching is like reverse engineer. And they were saying, look at the bigger picture and recreate from there, which you, you get it because I'm sure you do this all the time. Um, and they kept repeating. And this is where I went back to is like they said, see the landscape, right? Like take time to, so they were asking me, even though I already did this a month ago, they were telling me once again, because who I was a month ago is no longer the same who I am today, according to the guidance I was getting, right? Yeah. Which of course that's life. Yeah. But it was like, they were saying there was a big gap between who I was a month ago to who I am today, which logically I'm still trying to like identify those things. And they're, my voice is changing as I'm talking about that. Um, and part of what they were, what I was being encouraged, like see the landscape now, right? The, the texture, the flavor, the, the full experience of what I've stepped into today compared to who I was a month ago. Um, and as you're talking, like, how do you, with the whole evolution and, and like looking back, I think sometimes it's not even a time thing, right? Evolution and, and, and who I become can change drastically within a week. And, you know, it's not just a lifetime or it's not just 10 years from now. It's not just a year from now. It just can change in so many ways. And I think that that taking time to do the things that I'm sure you do too, it's like journaling and, and being present and introspective. It's like that gives us easy ways to measure where the growth has taken place so that we can not just celebrate it, but anchor it and remind ourselves that we have the ability, the courage and the, the strength needed to make other things happen. I, lo um, I, love, I love that you said that. And, and there's two things you said there. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I'm, I'm a strong believer and I always say this all the time is I mean, we're constantly evolving. We're constantly changing. I mean, every, every second we're on earth, something's changed. I mean, that's just reality. Right. But I love something that I, I, I've heard years ago and I say it all the time is, is look down at your feet, live mm -hmm. where your feet are. Right. So it's essentially is being present. Yes. I think a lot of us are so prone to think of the future and we build anxiety of what could happen. Mm -hmm. or we hold on to the past too much. Mm -hmm. We don't take the past as a lesson. We don't take the past as a moment that's past that we've learned from. We, 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 we focus so much energy and time on something we can't change, mm -hmm. or we focus so much time and energy and anxiety, and it builds this anxiety in us of what could happen, uh, that we are not living in the moment. We're not living in the present. And the moment you could learn to live in the present is, is such a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, is, that is just a gift that once you could come to a realization of it, of living in the present and, and just taking your past, learning from it, don't forget it. If it's, if it's a lesson that's, that was meant to be learned, lock it in there, lock it a little key, put it in your back pocket. Don't forget about it. And the future just it's just is it's, it's just guidance to where you have to go. That's all it is. Just a guidance, just a pathway to where you got to go. That's all it is. Don't put so much effort into it because every single day things happen. You walk out of your house every morning, man. There could be a car accident. They could, things change. So you putting so much effort into planning 
the future. And I'm all about goal setting, but I understand too, that goals change and adapt daily. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to pivot when the moment comes. Yes. And that's business. That's life. That's family, no matter what it is, right? You have to be able to pivot when the moment comes. Um, This has been a really, we've been at it for almost an hour and a half. Uh, this is in my podcast usually go about 45 minutes. So it's been a great conversation. Anything you want to add before we get, we uh, head out today? I would love to read the last something here that yeah, they're highlighting. Yeah. Is that okay? Um, cause you said it perfectly. There's two things you said that if you're open to it, I'll speak to, um, one is, and you said it perfectly. So I'm not going to try to repeat it because I feel like I'm, it's going to be flawed. Um, but one of the things that they're highlighting in my notes is, they said, you know, when you're mapping out this bigger vision, so they said the bigger vision is pulling you, right? We have this conception that <clears throat> some of my voice changes is because energy is moving, by the way, and things are moving for people who are needing to listen, including myself to this. Um, so there's this illusion that sometimes we hold on to that we're creating something, we're building something. And it's like our doing, our doing, our doing. And we fail to recognize that whatever has been seeded, like with you, with your vision, your mission, your coaching, even this podcast, it's like there is something meeting you on the other side that actually was calling you, right? It's like this podcast wanted to come to life and you heard the call. Right. So it's like that idea, the bigger vision is actually calling you more than you think you're calling it. And, and what they said is like, and they said, and know the bigger picture. So the vision we have, the bigger picture is always going to be tainted with illusion. So you also have to be clever and present enough to be expanded into the bigger vision itself that is calling you. Usually what is trying to be born and created is much more elaborate and expansive than the human mind can fully conceive. And even just the idea of you, what you said with being present is that there's a true gift, even with success and wealth and and abundance and business that when we truly can be present and just check in as often as we are able, I say able, because I think it's really a decision that we make, right? We make that a priority. Um, understanding that what we think we're creating is actually called us into creation. And that which is wanting to be given life is, is giving us the path as much as we think we're creating the path ourselves. Um, and, and this is for another conversation, but you, you were talking. And so what happens to me, I, I hear things that people might be thinking or saying as, as they're listening to us. And I audibly heard a few voices say, well, how, how are you present? How, how do you, how are you present? Like, okay, well, I think I'm present, right? So there's this question that came up. So if that's you, whoever's listening to us, like if that question's coming up, like, how do you become present? One of the best ways that I feel like the angels beings have taught me and they, I literally went, I went into training and I would every day go out and I would spend an hour, um, an hour in nature, and it was literally them training to fine tune all my senses. Like, what do you, like, what are you seeing? What are you actually seeing? And it wasn't like a logical thing. It was like an, like for me to become so present into what I was seeing, where it became an experience. What are you hearing? How does it feel in your body? Like, what does it sound like? What, what, what memories does it trigger? What inspiration, like, like really be one with the experience. And then I check in all my senses. So just a very simple process. If this is a question, that came up or came up for anybody who's listening or who it came up because again I heard the voice um the voices is like that's a very simple practical way to begin right even if it's 10 minutes a day like just go through your senses yeah I I I find with with being present is um is is giving your full attention to what you're doing at that moment simple breakdown if I'm having this conversation with you, I'm present with you right now. If I'm home with my kids and, and I'm doing something with them, that phone is off. Mm-hmm. I'm off electronics. I'm off TVs off. I'm present with them at that moment. And I give my full self to them at that moment. Or if I'm, if I'm working at my car, I'm fully present at that moment, working on my car It's living in the moment and being present. in, like I said, your sense of being aware of where you are, what you're doing 
enjoying what you're doing, um, whether you're at the gym, whatever, is being present at that moment. And I think a lot of us are not present in that moment because they'll be at the gym, for example, and they're working out, but they're thinking constantly, okay, I got to do this today. I got to do this later on. I got to do this, this after. I got to go pick up the... They're not really enjoying the process of that moment. So um, to me, being present just really enjoying the process of that moment and eliminating outside distractions at that moment. And there are going to be times you're going to multitask. Don't get me wrong. Like I use my driving time. Like when I go up twice a week to the cottage to do a rentals. Now I got a two and a half hour there, two and a half hour drive back. And that's my, that's my multitasking time. I'm taking phone calls. I'm doing coaching. Calls. You multitask. So there's certain times when you have to multitask. We are busy. Life is hectic, but there's certain moments where you just need to shut everything else out and just be present. Just enjoy the moment, enjoy the process, enjoy what is around you. And like you said, your senses, your smells, your, your tastes. And, and I love the whole nature thing. Cause I'm a big hiker. I love hiking and um, being present with nature. Is so, so important. Be able to just hear the sounds, the birds, the, the smells. If you could get into that zone is so powerful. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Ah, so good. So good. Where could our audience find you? So they're welcome to visit theangelcoach.com. That's on my website. And also they can find me on social media as the angel coach as well. And um, with the kids program and anybody who feels inspired to even get support once a month, I do once a month calls for free and I just share guidance. Um, And you can access that through Awaken Superhuman. Dot com and awaken superhuman and, and that's the mission and vision to help people truly own and understand that we are we're all superhumans walking around not yet realizing that we need to wake up to that you know that we're sleep we're sleeping and it's time for us to become awakened to that the truth of who we are so looking forward to connecting again Jeff thank you so much for the opportunity this was wonderful I'm gonna ask you one last question Yes. And I, and I usually ask everybody this. And, uh, and for some reason, I wasn't wasn't going to ask you this, but I'm going to ask you either way. If something were to happen to you today, in a few words, how would you want to be remembered, described by your loved ones? Someone who really, truly really loved, who showed up authentically loving them. And, and I feel like that's, my priority. And I want, I would love for that to be truly received and owned and understood by everyone who's touched my life. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Thank you so much. Hon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's a wrap for today. I want to thank our guest, Emily, for taking time for an incredibly busy schedule to be a guest on the Jeff Nosian podcast. Great conversation. Incredible person doing amazing things. I really enjoy this one. If you guys enjoyed as much as I have, like always, tell your friends, tell your family, spread the word. We're trying to build something special here. Leave a review. Five stars will be absolutely amazing. Myself, my team love spending time reading the reviews. Hit the subscribe button. We love building up our YouTube channel. Until next week, guys, keep moving forward. This podcast is brought to you by BetterHelp. With the current climate in this world, it's now more important than ever to take stock in your mental health and for once, take time to work on yourself. BetterHelp offers a personalized online counseling and therapy service that will connect you to a safe and private online environment. BetterHelp is here to assess you with your needs and match you with your own licensed therapist. It's a lot more affordable than your traditional counseling and financial aid is always available. Right now, Jeff Knows Inc. listeners get an extra 10% off your first month just by visiting BetterHelp.com forward slash Jeff knows that's right visit b-e-t-t-e-r-h-e-l-p.com forward slash Jeff knows to get 10% off your first month